We'll start with going over ggplot2, some extras and extensions. The ggplot2 framework is set up so that other people can create packages that add on to it. There are now a number of different extensions available. They include things like more themes, and some of you have already used that with ggthemes to pull additional themes from that extra package. Um, some useful additions, these can be in terms of new geoms you can use. Um, in some cases, they're helping some with, with scales, like color scales, and we'll look at some examples of that. And in general, some tools for plotting different types of data. So if you have data, for example, for a network or data on um, a genomic data or gene expression, there are specific things that might work well with those specific types of data. There is a collection through our studio of a gallery of ggplot2 extensions. I'm not sure that this it covers everything that's out there, but it certainly has a lot of stuff. So let me show you that. If you Google ggplot2 extensions, you should be able to get directly to that. On the page, there is a gallery. And then you can leave the CRAN only over here. You can leave that selected, and that's only going to be packages that have been published on CRAN. But you can also turn that out, and then you will get some extra packages that might include um, things that are on another repository, like Bioconductor, or things that might still be in development and on GitHub. So if you scroll down on this page, you can see lots and lots of different examples. Um, so here's one, ggAnimate, that's letting you animate ggplots. Um, we're going to look a little bit about Patchwork, which lets you put different plots together. Uh, ggThemes, which as I mentioned, several of you have already used. Uh, ggRepel we'll talk about today, but they're all, they're all kinds of things. They're things that are very general purpose, but then there are also a lot of things that are very specific. So as you scroll down, you can see um, here's an example of one that's pretty specific, this GG tree that's letting you look at networked or hierarchical data. So for any of these, you can open up the link for that. Oh, that one's not going to go through. Let's do it for the GG IRA. And typically, it will take you to the GitHub page for that particular extension package. If you scroll down, a lot of times there will be a README that gives an overview of how you use that package and then also some examples of how you might use that. All right, scrolling through, I wanted to point out a few more. So here's one example. A lot of these are doing some pretty creative things. So this is if you want to show how, how something is concentrated at different parts of the body or other measurements that are specific to parts of the body. And if you see going through, so a lot, of, a lot of these are based on a map of the of the human body or a mouse body. Um, and as you scroll down and look at the examples, one of the things that I want to point out here is that a lot of times these will follow examples that are pretty similar to the ggplot stuff that you've already done. So this one, it looks like it's it's a whole function. Let me see if I can find one that's more specific in terms of adding on a, G, a geom. So here's GG Alluvial for creating these alluvial plots. And let's see. Yeah, so this is one of the examples. Many of these, you'll end up using the same kind of ggplot um, code, but you will have an extra geom that you can add on. So this fits very nicely together with the overall ggplot structure. All right, so you've already used themes a lot. We're going to start with some of these extensions for themes. And you've already used a ggplot extension package specifically for that. Uh, there are several of those. You've probably used ggthemes, but there's also ggthemer, ggtech, ggsci. So we can look at a few examples in ggthemes. You have ones like 538 or from Economist, the magazine The Economist, uh, Stephen Pugh. And for all of those, if you remember, you're just adding on one line for the theme. Another package that's quite useful for complementing ggplots is the scale package. This gives you some other options for labeling the, the numbers that show up on the x or y axis or color or something else of your ggplot. So to show a lot of these examples, for the rest of the slides, I've saved a ggplot object um, that we can just add on to so that I don't have to repeat that, that code for our main object every single time. 
So here's the storm plot. So this, this object right here is the object that you created in the end of the first part of the in-course exercise for chapter eight. And so now we're just adding on elements to that each time. So if I load the scales package, then it does things like it lets me go in and for the numbers, now this number has a comma separating it. I don't have to go through and add this myself. I can just do that the labels equals comma, and it automatically makes these labelings prettier and a little bit easier to read. Um, I've done that in this case for both the x-axis and the y-axis, and you can see on both of those axes we have those. There are other things you can add with this as well, like, like um, a dollar sign or the percent sign, and it's the same kind of syntax you're adding into the scale call that the labels equal a dollar or labels equals percent. Next, I wanted to show, again, along the themes of scales, another color scale package that's very useful to look at. Um, so this is called the Veritas package. There's actually, if you're interested in this, a very nice uh, YouTube video that goes through, and it's somebody giving a talk on all the thought that went into developing this color scale and what it does that makes it really nice to use. Uh, from the help file on CRAN, uh, there's a description of this. It's a color map that's designed in a way that it is perceptually uniform when you cover, when you look at colors that are at different levels. Um, also, when you print it out in black and white or grayscale, it's going to be true. You're going to be able to see those same um, differences in levels as you go across as if you could see it in color. This is really helpful for a lot of scientific articles because a lot of times people are still printing them out in black and white to read them. And also for people with the most common type of color blindness, these scales are still going to, to be something where, where they can correctly perceive the differences. Um, so I put a link through here. There's a really nice introduction to this through the vignette for the package. You can also pull that up if you search for Cram Veritas Intro. It's the first thing that comes up. This is an introduction vignette for the whole package. And if you go down, it gives you a lot of details on the package. And it also goes through and shows some comparisons with other ones and also what these look like for people with different types of color blindness. And so you can start to see um, how it's helpful to use these. All right, so these, the, when you use Veritas, it actually comes with, with four scales that you can use. The default is called Veritas, but you can also, with the option parameter, you can set either of these other three, uh, Magma, Inferno, and Plasma, and they're all following those kinds of standards. There's also a fifth that they've added more recently, I believe, called CI Veritas, um, and so that's a, that's a new option that you can get with that as well. All right, so let me show an example of doing that. And in this case, that World Cup data set didn't really map well. This is, I think, most useful for showing continuous numerical values. So instead, I'm showing a different example of a different kind of geome here. So we have something with, with continuous data. So I've took the, taken the state storms data that we were working with, and I'm doing ggplot. Again, the area versus the number of events. But now I'm using something, the geome is called a, a hex spin geome. So this is something where instead of a histogram where you're looking at distribution across one dimension, it's letting you look across two dimensions. And it bends all of that space into these hexagonal bins. And then the color of that bin is representing how many observations fall in that part of the plot. So in this case, we only have 50 points. I'm not sure if, if this is incredibly helpful for showing this, but as you get more and more data points, this can be really helpful because a lot of times your data, when you plot it as a scatter plot, is just all on top of each other and you can't see the, the um, because of the overlap in points and dense areas, it's really hard to see if there are some areas that are more concentrated than others. So in this case, this color being light means that we have a really high number of states in that region of the graph around eight. And this one's also looks like it's a pretty high number. The bins here is just specifying how many, how, how, how to divide to, to create the bins if the bins should be large or small. 
All right, so to use the Viridis scale, all you have to do is add on a layer. So you can do scale fill Viridis in this case because for the hex bin, the aesthetic that it's mapping the count to is the fill. If you're trying to use it for color, you would use scale color Viridis here. The default again is to do um, the Verita scale of those of those four scales I showed, but if you wanted to do a different one, you could put in option equals and then you do it by letter. So the help files help with this or the vignette. But there are options A, B, C, D, and now that they've added that, that fifth one, E, and so you put in that option to change um, to magma or plasma or one of the, the others. All right, so next let's talk through, for ggplot extensions, some of the other geomes that you can add and, and some other packages that we have that help with things like arranging different ggplot objects to all create one figure. So I want to start with talking about repelling text labels. So I've taken that storm plot that we had and I've added some faceting. So it's faceted by region now. So we have four different plots for the four different regions. And I've added on a label on each point now. So, and these are actually covering up the original points, but you can see that this point was for Texas evidently, this one's for Alaska and so on. A lot of times when you use the GM labels, you get cases where in dense areas of a lot of data, everything's on top of each other and you can't see labels because they are overlapping each other. The other thing that can happen is you have labels that are going off the page. So all of this means that it's not very helpful to add the labels in this case because it's really hard to, to get anything useful from it. There is a ggplot extension. It's a package called ggrepel. It's very, very clever. It goes through and runs an algorithm to position your labels and then draw lines if it needs to. So in this case, um, all of the labels are going to go near the point now. If it's really close to the point, like Pennsylvania and New York here, it won't do a line to it. But if it needs to move the label further away to be able to see it, then it'll do a line to it there. This is still pretty dense data, so we still have a few cases where we have some overlap where it's hard to read something. But in many cases, this can solve a lot of the problems of having overlapping labels. So all you have to do with this is load the ggrepel package once you have it installed. And then instead of doing geom label, you're doing geom label repel. But then the aesthetic mapping is the same as with the label. All right, so as I mentioned, that, that can take care of a lot of the problems, but it might not solve all of them. Uh, so in some cases, you might not want to label every single point. If you have lots and lots of points, you might instead want to label notable points. And I know some of you did this in your homework where you went through and you, you labeled outliers to help identify what those outliers were. In class, we were talking about, we were noticing that we saw a point way over with a very high land area, but not a lot of events. And then we saw one point that really w was extreme in terms of the number of events. And so now we can go through and we can see that that one is uh, Texas, which I think was the guess of somebody in the class. And then this is Alaska, as we talked about earlier. So to highlight these points, instead of doing a GM text or GM label, you do GG highlight. So this is in a package called GG highlight. And this, you put in the label key, that's the column that has the information we want to use for labels. And then we can also specify which criteria we want a point to have to meet or a piece of data to have to meet before we highlight it. So this is saying we'll highlight places where the area is greater than 150,000 square miles or the number of events is higher than 1,500. And so this is going through and picking out some of those conditions to label. All right, the next one I wanted to talk about is the case where you have several ggplot objects and you want to create a figure that has all of them. You can think of this in terms of multi-panel figures. Uh, there are a few packages that help you do this, and one that I think is really nice is called Patchwork. This one's not up on CRAN yet, so inst to install it, you need to get it from GitHub. Uh, so this is the GitHub name of the user who posted it and then the, the name of the repository where it's posted. And if somebody posts a package to GitHub that's a working package, then you can install it and run it on your computer, even if it's not up on CRAN or another repository yet, 
The DevTools package has this install GitHub function that lets you pull that in and do that. Now for a lot of these, it, it's building the code from source, so you might need to get something like R, I think it's R tools for Windows, and then it's there's a development toolkit for, for Macs. I can't remember the name of it right now, but you need to have a few extra things sometimes on your computer to be able to do this because if there's code that's compiled, it needs to, to be able to compile that on your computer. Um, plain R code does not need to be compiled, but if it, a lot of R packages will have some C or some C++ or other languages uh, for some of the functions, and in those cases, it, it won't be able to run without those. All right, so let's look at this. If we wanted to plot seasonal patterns and events in the five counties with the highest number of events and then add that on, um, that's what we're trying to create here. And let me show that first and then we'll back up and do that. So this is the final plot that we're trying to create. If I were doing this for a real paper, I'd probably play around some with um, the sizes for everything and make it a little bit more attractive. But you can see here on the same ggplot, we have one plot that is a scatter plot, so showing something for all of the states aggregated at the state level. And then we have one thing down here where we've taken the five counties with the highest number of events. We've labeled it with the, the name of the county and its state. And then we're showing over the course of the year the number of events. So we can start looking for some seasonal patterns in number of events over the year. So we're going to start out first by creating this object, and then we'll look at how we can use that ggplot extension to put both of the objects in the same plot. All right, so first we need to pull out the top counties. So I've taken the storms, and then I've grouped them by uh, the FIPS and the state, and in this case, I'm grouping them by the state just so I can keep that information with it. Um, once you know the FIPS codes, it's five digits, so the information for the state's in there, but this will let me later create those labels. Uh, and the same thing with the CZ name. By grouping by all of these, I'll have the information that I need after I count to go in and do the labels that I want to create. Uh, so then I'll count and ungroup. And then this top in function from dplyr, I believe, lets us pick out the top five counties. And with weight, we say what column of the data we want to use to determine what which ones are the top five. So here I've done n. If you remember, after you count, you get that n, col n column that says the number of rows that were in that before you counted it. And so this is saying pick out the top five in terms of the number of rows or the number of events that occurred in the county. All right, so then I can go through and create a plot with the time patterns. So I'm taking the original storms data, using the semi join function to limit it to just the events that happened in those top five counties. Uh, then I can do a little bit of work here. This is pasting together the county name and then putting county and then the state. I need to be a little bit careful here in um, Louisiana. They're actually called parishes instead of counties. So if any of these have been in Louisiana, I probably would have had to play around a little bit more with this part of it. I'm also pulling out the month from the date. So if you remember, we have that begin date time. The month function from Luber date lets you pull out just that piece. Then I can count by county and month. So this syntax is a little bit different from what you've seen before. Typically, we'll group by something and then count with nothing in between. But if you want to, when you run the count, you can specify there the things that you would have grouped by to do that. And so I'm doing that slightly shorter syntax here. Then I'm piping straight into ggplot. Along the x-axis, I have month. Along the y-axis, this counts the number of events in that month. I'm doing geo and bar, and since I've already done the count, um, I can just do that the stat equals identity for that. I think a lot of you have done those in homeworks by now. And then I'm doing facet wrapping by the counties, and I'm using factor reorder from the forecast package inside that to, uh, to rank those so that the one with the most events comes first, and then the one with the next most events in sale line, because otherwise the default would have been alphabetical, which I don't think is very helpful in this case. And then I've got some stuff here with scale X continuous and scale Y continuous where I'm using nicer names or in some cases taking out the name entirely when it's clear from the axis breaks what's going on. And then also seeing where I want the breaks to happen. Since these are going to be pretty small, I'm specifying these to not have too many breaks so that it will show up cleanly and the numbers won't be kind of overlapping with each other. 
All right, so here's the plot that we've created. Again, it's got one facet, one little panel per county for these top five counties, and then it's measuring frequency of events on the x-axis, and then the month when the event occurred, or at least began. Excuse me, this was on the y-axis, this is on the, on the x-axis. All right, so here's where patchwork comes in. We have storm plot, which was our initial scatter plot, and then we have this new plot called top counties month. And then we can put these together once we've loaded patchwork by just adding on this plot layout. We say here the number of columns we want uh, the final plot to have, and then this is the heights of those two. So this is saying that I want the first plot to be twice as tall as the second plot. And then once we run that, you can see that indeed this is taking about up about twice as much space as this is, and this is put the two together. You could do fancier versions too if you want. If you want to add on to one of your ggplots or do the whole code to create a ggplot object, you can still do that here, but you need to wrap that whole thing that you would have done for the plot by itself in parentheses. So this is going through and adding some highlighting and then this is adding on the top counties by month for the second one, and this is as before, putting them together. So you can see now we've got that GG highlight running. There's some other packages that help with this as well. There's Grid Extra, which you may have used. We've had some examples where we've done it, and I certainly use it in the slides to be able to put different plots on the same slide together. There's also one called CalPlot, which can help in doing this, these um, kind of multi-panel plots. All right, so I recommend now that you take a break and do the second part of the in-course exercise. This is for chapter eight. Um, I'll continue on this slide and video. Most of this exercise is involving going back through the code that I just talked about and the ggplot extensions I just talked about and trying out some of them to get a feel for how they're working. All right, so hopefully you've had the chance to do the exercise. Uh, there are a few more things that I wanted to talk about in terms of other types of plots or extensions. Uh, so one is heat maps, and these we can actually make. There's some, some packages in R that will do fancy ones, but we can do the basic ones using the basic ggplot2 uh, functions without even adding things on. These can be really useful for seeing how things are distributed across two variables. So um, let me actually show an example first. So here's an example. In this case, um, we're looking at uh, the different people who can report. So for these storm events, you can have the reports come in from a lot of different people. It can be somebody from the National Weather Service, it can be from the public, it can be from people who are trained as spotters, emergency managers, 911, and so on. And then um, you have different types of events. So here I've listed some. We've got funnel clouds and lightning and heavy rain and so on. So a heat map takes each kind of square that lines up. So this is a square for public, and for funnel cloud. And then it's using the fill color to indicate some numerical value. So in this case, it's saying that the number of events is pretty low, especially in comparison to, to kind of other squares for the combination of funnel clouds that are reported by the public that make it into this database. And so you can look at this and you can see some interesting things like for hail, it, it's very differential where most of it is being reported by the public or by a trained spotter. And then thunderstorm winds, we've got several categories of people who are reporting these, but then a pretty stark difference as we get down to some others. And then for some of these events, they're just so much rarer than things like hail and thunderstorm wind that we're having a hard time kind of picking up lots of differences as we look further into them. All right, so let's look at how to make this plot and then it's actually the geom tile function that's going in and adding the geom for filling in each of those little tiles or squares. All right, so in this case, I took the original storm data and I filtered to just get events, a certain set of events. So we're only going to keep the rows where the event type is thunderstorm, wind, heavy rain, funnel cloud, flash lightning, flood, hail, or lightning, excuse me, flash flood. And then I'm going to add another filter. I'm only going to pull the events where the source 
is one of these sources. So once I do that, I've got the rows filtered down to just the subset that I want to look at for this plot. I grouped by event type and source and then got the count. And then I'm doing this ungrouping um, to, to take off that kind of like grouped tag on the data. So if we look at things now, and this is going a little bit off the page, but you can see that we have event type, so flash flood, and then source, 911 call centers. And then we've got this number for how many events met those two criteria. It was a flash flood where the source of the event information was a 911 call center. So we've got this for every combination of each of these event types and each of these sources as long as there was at least one event that fell in that category. All right, so here's where we create the plot with that data. I'm loading the Brewerdus package. Um, again, that's what's making these colors different. Otherwise, I think it would be that blue scale that you often get when you map continuous data to the color aesthetic or the fill aesthetic. And then I'm going to use uh, four cats to rearrange the order of this. So the default order would probably have been alphabetical for each of these because they're both factors. But we can reorder those so that we get these cases where the things that are happening most often all group together and then rarer things show up other places. And that ordering and heat maps can often be very important to help pick out patterns. All right, so in this case, I'm using the data we just created. For the aesthetic, I'm going to map X to event type, but only once I've used factor reorder to reorder those event types based on the total number. Um, so this N is saying that we're using the number of events, and then the sum is saying take these events for everything. So in other words, for event type, we're going to, for this, we're counting up all the number regardless of which um, type of person reported it. And then for doing the order for for public and for the other types of reporters, we are um, adding up regardless of event type. And those are ordered by that. So public is reporting the most events regardless of what type. And then thunderstorm wind has the most types of events reported regardless of the source that's reporting it. So all of that's being done here with the factor reorder. And then the geom I add is just a tile. For the tile, the required aesthetic is fill. That's the only one we're using here. And this is saying use that column that has the count of values. So if you go back and look, this is the end column where it counts up the number of events in that category. Then I've just got a few little extras here. I'm doing the, the Verita scale instead of the default, using the labs to change some of the different labeling. And you can see here for this fill equals number of events, that's what's changing and making it a little bit nicer on this legend. And then because this is taking up so much room, to be able to kind of list out all of these names fully. Typically, the default is for the legend to be over here, but I'm using this theme legend position equals bottom to move that down to the bottom so that it doesn't take up so much space there in the side so that the heat map doesn't get um, squished. All right, here's another example of adding a new geom based on one of these ggplot extensions. So this is called an alluvial plot. And when you have different categories on something, this can be a good way, as can mosaic plots, but this can be a good way to explore um, how things are distributed across those, those categorical variables. So this takes one variable, this is the type, and you can do this actually for multiple variables. In this case, we're just doing two. And then it does source. And for each of these, the lines over here are connecting the number of events, the width of them indicates the number of events that match up with a certain source. So the fact that here from flash flood, maybe one of the thicker lines is going to, it looks like emergency manager. So that's suggesting that a lot of the flash floods are getting reported by emergency managers. Uh, you can see with hail that many of those are coming from train spotters. So that's how to interpret these. Uh, to create one, I'm taking that same data that we just used. And in this case, for the alluvium geome, you need to specify in the aesthetics what the axis 1 value is. So that's the value I'm doing here. And what the axis 2 value is, doing that here. I believe you can add on and have other axes, and then you would continue to have um, other things with lines connecting. And then your Y is saying the number of events. So this would scale the width of this 
in terms of the number of events based on, on the units that you have over here. And across all of these different event types, we have, it looks like maybe 30,000, not quite 30,000 events total. All right, then I've done a few other things. So the geom alluvial is what's actually showing that. Um, we could have done it without adding in a fill, but I wanted to have different colors for different types of events. And so I took and did this fill as one color if the event is a flash flood or a flood, so two different categories of flood, and let it be another color if it was anything else. And you can see here that the flood events are blue and then all of the other types of events are red. I did a minimal theme here so that um, there's not a lot else going on in that plot. There's not a obtrusive background scale or anything like that. All right, um, and then I use uh, geom text to label these these strata, and then again with the theme, I can add on the that the legend should go at the top, and that the label for that for fill should be flood event, so that this doesn't show up as the original column name, but instead shows up as this. All right, uh, let's look at one more: the GG Ridges package. This lets you look at the distribution of several different levels across another variable. So let me show an example of that and then we'll look at the code. So here's the example. In this case, I'm taking the day and the year and then different types of sources for these events. And I am curious in this case if there are seasonal patterns and how many events are reported by different sources. So you can look through this and see that for insurance companies, for example, we're seeing some peak in the spring and then a really big peak. This looks like maybe in the summer or the early fall and then not much reported later in the year toward, towards winter. Uh, for others, we see that it's a little bit more even, but for a lot of these, it does look like there is either a summer or maybe a fall peak. And then for the official National Weather Service observations, that one actually is following a, a different trend where it's maybe lowest in that period of late summer and early fall, and there are some peaks other times of the year. In this case, I've added color for day of the year just to help illustrate that pattern over time, but you could also do this without. Um, in this case, the x-axis and the day and the year are showing the same. They're mapping to the same column in the data. A lot of times that, that gets to be a little bit overkill where you're showing the same thing with both color and with an X, uh, one of the axes. But in this case, is case maybe it helps to um, pick apart the trends. So for this data, again, I need to start by cleaning up the data and getting, getting it in the shape I need it to plot. So I'm creating a new data frame called storms by year. Uh, this is taking the original data frame and then I'm filtering just to certain sources. So these will be the final kind of lines that make it across or distributions that make it across uh, with the labels on the y-axis. Then I'm using Y day from Libra date to pull out the day of the year. So this will be one for January 1st. If it's not a leap year, it'll be 365 for December 31st and so on for all the days in the year. And then I'm grouping by the day and the source, the day of year and the source, and counting and again doing the ungrouping at the end. Then I can use ggplot with that data. I'm using the Veritas package again uh, to, to change the color scheme. In this case, I'm mapping x to y day. The y is mapped to source, and I'm using that factor reorder again to get in an order of number of events. And in this case, instead of doing the sum across the whole year, I've done the median number of events uh, across all the days. And descending equals true is changing, whether that's an ascending or descending for the order that shows up in. For the fill, I'm doing, I'm again doing the same as the X. All right, so then what I'm adding on, and this is from the GG ridges package, is the geom density ridges gradient. So that's what adds on these different ones. And then I can um, adjust the scale. So the default for that, again, if I didn't have the scale fill call, would be um, the kind of blue color that you often see for continuous variables that are mapped to color with ggplot. So in this case, I'm using scale fill veritas from the veritas package. I did the option equals V to use a different one of those scales. So this isn't using veritas, it's using one of the other ones that come with the veritas package. 
I can force this to make sure it's always starting on um, uh, the first day of the year and going later because we have the beginning date. Sometimes you might get events that had a beginning date before the year for this data in particular. And then here, um, I'm just changing the labels. All right, so this is all of the stuff on ggplot extensions. Uh, before the next week's class, though, and I'll make sure I email this to you, um, I'd like you all to register for GitHub. We're going to start using GitHub. And then also download and install Get for your computer. So I put some links in for both of these, but if you can do that before the class time, that's going to save us some time when we're working together in class. So we can spend more time setting up a specific repository and Get and GitHub rather than, than downloading these. So now we're at the point of, of mapping, so I will put that in a different uh, video to post.